Thank you so much, Anita. Um, we are happy to welcome some of our speakers back now for a live Q&A session. Um, we're grateful to have uh, Dr. Yavar Mohimi of Emeritus, uh, of Emeritus, Amy Malloy of Mental Health America in New York State. She's the project director there. Um, Ariana Gross of Covington, Georgia, who's our awesome youth advocate um, that when we saw testified in front of the Energy and Commerce Committee at the House of Representatives, at the U.S. House of Representatives, we knew we had to get her voice in the conversation here today. Um, and we have the immediate past president of the American Medical Association, Dr. Patrice Harris. Uh, we also have uh, Sam Brinton, the uh, Vice President of Advocacy and Government Affairs at the Trevor Project. Um, and thank you all so much for joining. We're uh, just so grateful to have you for a couple of minutes uh, today to answer some questions. Um, I'll start with uh, Dr. Harris, since we got a question right after your session earlier today. How do we emphasize using evidence-based strategies, yet there aren't evidence-based strategies that are culturally relevant? Absolutely. <laughs> Good to be uh, with you for this uh, live session. Just want to make sure you can hear me okay, because I do plan to write a book after we get through this, and it will be, uh, you're, you're on mute, right? So, <laughs> so nobody's still that. You know, that, that is a conundrum because we absolutely do always want uh, to promote the use of evidence-based strategies, um, but we don't always have the evidence that we need on particular populations. So let me just start with the broader. If there is data out there that shows the particular intervention works, uh, but perhaps it did not have the diversity and the trial participation, it's still valid, I believe. And so I don't think we should say, oh, because we didn't have a totally diverse uh, group that was a part of the uh, investigation, we should not use it. So that being said, we should be on a mission and be critically focused to make sure that going forward, we get the data on a diverse uh, population. That has to be in the going forward, again, because we've not had it in the past, but going forward, we have to make that commitment to center equity to make sure we have evidence on a diverse group of participants. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Harris. Uh, I think I wanted to kind of, kind of move over and talk a little bit about how the health system can be integrated with education and how kind of community agencies can all come together to meet the needs of students in schools. Um, you've talked a lot about integration. Um, Ariana and Amy, you guys are in the schools and working with other leaders in the schools. Um, would you like to share about how your um, mental health and education program, Amy, or Ariana, how some of your peer programs have kind of evolved over time in case someone is interested in how their organization might do some similar advocacy in their own school districts. Ariana, you wanna go first? <laughs> oh, sure. Um, thank you. For my program, um, the way that we've evolved, I think I'm with Dear Tara Success, which is my, um, my original organization that has allowed me to reach out to all these other ones. Um, we originally started out just a few people and we were just talking to youth and getting a message out there. And I think working with Stay Promise Clubs and Sandy Hook allowed us to get a bit more structure because they're like programs that put in place how we can best meet the needs of our students. And so giving this opportunity to us is so important. Um, me allowing, me just knowing that I have those resources to do that, give me direct if I can help people is um, the best. Another thing is that, is that you're, I'm sorry. No, I think um, there's some extra noise in the background. So I, I definitely understand if, if it's a little hard to get through that. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. It's just my brother, but uh, oh, I'm sorry. All, um, okay. We're working from home. Okay. We have, <laughs> we're in the pandemic. Yes. No reason to be embarrassed. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. But um, yeah, so I think the best way is to come up with a direct plan of how you're going to achieve your goals. So if your goal is to, like for our goal is to get into schools and teach students how to help their peers better. So we went from just like, you know, talking to them about like um, different topics every time to its direct plan using um, Saves Trusted Adult and um, Know the Science program. So the just having that like plan of how you want to go through with it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Ariana. Amy, would you talk a little bit yeah. about how your your program has evolved? Sure. And I think, you know, we have focused on um, mental health education in schools, but it's uh, we very quickly learned that it's not just about raising awareness and teaching students about mental health. It's this um, whole sort of system that wraps around that. And so going back to that idea of integration, I think there's some really, really wonderful models, community schools models. Um, for how we can bring some of those services to where people are. But at the end of the day, not everyone has access to those kinds of resources. And so it really is about partnering with community providers um, and other community organizations and stakeholders like libraries or boys and girls clubs or peer support organizations, um, peer advocacy to help families and students and staff in schools um, deliver all the services that are needed. And, and I think in that way, we can also address a lot of barriers that create um, you know, access issues for families and for students. And so this and mental health education is really just a part of a bigger puzzle um, and all of it works together. And, and also to that end, I think that um, community providers can be a great partner in helping educate students and families about the resources that are available, the treatment options that are available and can do it in a way that is um, really responsive to the needs of the individual communities. So those kinds of relationships are really, really important in, in, in that integration. Um, schools are being asked to do more with less always and so wherever we can partner and help each other out that's really that's going to be really important um i know there are some uh specific kind of evidence-based um health services that are being provided to students um through cdc's injury prevention program sam can you talk about maybe what uh what benefits that some students are are finding in getting health health services at school or through telehealth now that we're in the pandemic, but through their school. Yeah, it's schools have been um, a, a saving grace, I would call it in a way for LGBTQ youth. And so as we have moved and transitioned to education, maybe at home, we're noticing that although there may not be a lot more uh, calls to maybe like the National Lifeline, the Trevor Project is getting nearly twice as many contacts of crisis um, during COVID as before because schools weren't quite ready to provide um, what I would call, uh, you know, extremely um, private and, and safe spaces um, in remote locations, right? Like they, their whole point was that you were able to get this mental health care. And like, as you mentioned, Karen, right? Like they were able to get access to really great services when they were in the school building. But how does it work when you can't really tell the person across on this Zoom screen, you know, that you're LGBT and that you may need a little bit different services because your parents may be sitting right across the table from you. And so I think how schools will, um, meet this challenge is going to be based on how they recognize the differences in high-risk populations. It doesn't mean that anyone is necessarily um, doomed, and it doesn't mean that anyone deserves to be celebrated. It just recognizes different needs for different people. And for LGBTQ youth specifically, I think one of the great things that I love about Amy's work is that it says to a school, you need to, you are already doing good things let's help you do even better things, right? Let's give you the resources to do the great things. Um, and as Ariana was mentioning, right? Like we, it's, it's about making sure that we're listening. I think when you, Karen, you, you did mention a little bit like 
CDC has some of these resources and we've been working closely with them to make sure that people know that, you know, LGBTQ youth are in super crisis. We've heard the CDC stat of one in four young adults seriously considering suicide in June. That's why the Trevor Project is getting so many calls is because we're hearing from people that they're not getting the services that they necessarily need at, um, as they're returning to school. So I think it's going to be really critical that we support community-based services, right? So what can we do to build a picture around an, a young person at high risk that says, you may not be in the schoolroom anymore, but you still have the same resources. And we're going to figure out ways to match those resources to your specific needs, not just assume that every single person is super glad that they get to sit across the, you know, um, table from their parents when they're trying to have these types of conversations. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I want to just turn to Dr. Mohini uh, before we have to wrap up. We have um, a little bit about your background in working with the Medicaid population, which I think you said it's about 50% youth, about 50% adults. Can you share with us a little bit about um, why prevention is important in your space and, and what you're doing to um, kind of move things upstream so that <laughs> your system, your whole system can um, ensure that there's some accountability for meeting the needs of young people? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think historically when you think about, you know, Medicaid or just insurance in general, it's more reactive and responsive to claims and the information that they're getting based on utilization, right? So if a child shows up in the hospital, then there, there's an awareness of the psychiatric crisis that was happening. But how do we sort of know, how do we get ahead of that and sort of know who are our at-risk kids and what can we be doing to avoid that hospitalization to begin with? Because it's good for the system, it's good for them to not be on that acute level of care if we can get them into more outpatient uh, level care sooner, right? So we have different ways of trying to um, triage and, and, and tier our, our, our network of, of members and trying to figure out more proactive ways of outreach, you know, whether it's through tech space. Now we have the capabilities now of a lot of virtual visits that we didn't necessarily have before. So if somebody calls in crisis or they're calling our care management, you know, there's no reason why we can't get a visit with a provider within 24 hours, you know, whereas before some of those access issues caused um, you know, some barriers for folks getting into the care they needed. So I think we're at, we're at a unique place now where prevention is much more capable in, in the Medicaid space because we're, we're monitoring how everyone's doing as a response to COVID too, because we're, we're really wanting to make sure our at-risk populations, whether on the physical health side or the behavioral health side, are having their needs met and making sure they're aware that virtual care is an option for them now too. Thank you. And then I think one final question for anyone to answer we, that came in is about social emotional learning for infants and toddlers. So is anyone aware of how prevalent um, uh, social emotional learning is for, for children as young as, you know, one years old or two years old? Well, I would just say not enough, clearly. Uh, that I think we know there, of course, are programs here and there, but that is an area that's ripe uh, for improvement um, in a ripe for a lot of work incorporating that, of course, into work that we're already thinking about regarding trauma-informed care, regarding pre-K, working with families, um, integrating that into, I guess it would be primary care, but the work between pediatricians and and other uh, clinicians that are more specialized in mental health. So I, I just think certainly not enough an area that we really need to pay particular attention to and to make sure, as Sam said, there are adequate resources to do the work. Sure. Thank you so much for that response. Um, you know, I have to admit that it was only last year that I learned there is kind of um, mental health and substance use testing of infants and during the neonatal period. 
Um, and so there's if you if there's a way to figure out that something is wrong, <laughs> then there should be also a way to help um, treat and prevent um, something from going wrong or for for making improvements. Um, and Karen, and if I could just add, because we don't want people to think that we are diagnosing uh, disorders in infants, right? It, it's really <laughs> about uh, working with families and making sure that they are really developing appropriately more so than, you know, diagnosing problems. And I love that too, because it talks about prevention and it talks about the important work we need to do um, on the early intervention and prevention side and not really even about diagnosing. They're all important, uh, but I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. It is a, a great pleasure of ours to have you here live, um, even just for a brief moment. Um, thank you for the work and please continue forward. Um, I will turn it now to Dr. Don Mordecai, who uh, the audience may recall is the national leader for mental health and wellness at Kaiser Permanente, our sponsor. Uh, we're so grateful for um, the funding that Kaiser put together and, and, and gave us for this program, Policy Institute, moving upstream. Um, Don will provide closing remarks at this time. Um, and we want to thank he and his colleagues in particular, um, Kevin and Shannon and Samantha and Cecilia, uh, everyone who, who made sure that um, this, that he was able to join today. And uh, thank you for your work advancing uh, uh, early intervention and prevention of mental health. Well, uh, thank you, Karen. Um, we're, we're so pleased to be able to support this program. I mean, it's the, the range of voices that we've heard from today the range of topics has been absolutely incredible. Um, it, it felt like every single person made important contributions. So for me to try and sum it all up in some magic statement is is impossible. So um, you know, let me let me say a couple things. Um, one is it's absolutely clear that there are opportunities before us, even despite the incredible challenges um, that we're all facing from the pandemic, from the economic collapse. Um, and I would say even some of the challenges, for instance, around racial justice also present incredible opportunities for us, as we heard around um, health equity and, and issues like that. Um, I did wanna call out, you know, we started out with, with Congressperson Katko and um, the, the, the thing that struck me most from, from what he said was, you know, there are very powerful people, you know, Congress people of the United States who care about these issues. And we should never forget about that and never forget that they need our support, right? They need to hear from us that we care about these issues too, that we vote on these issues and things like that. So, so they need to know that we, we have their backs. Um, we got to hear from several people who have successfully advocated themselves uh, for policy changes that make a difference for youth and, and adults uh, with mental health and substance use issues. And so I would say to all of us, you know, we can be those people too. Uh, as, as Dr. McCoy said, you know, be that champion. Um, we, we are the ones who care about these issues and, and we need to use our voices um, to make things happen. Um, Great to hear from Dr. Harris, uh, who is a fellow child psychiatrist, the, the first uh, black woman uh, head of the AMA, um, just a terrific voice um, on these issues. And um, you know, she reminded us about the importance of adverse childhood experiences and recognizing that many, many of the children in our society experience adverse childhood experiences and that those experiences have an impact long th throughout the lifespan um, and it's a mental health impact it's a physical health impact it's a social health impact and so if we can address things upstream address adverse childhood experiences um, that could be very powerful um, some of you may know that kaiser permanente was uh, we, we did the original research on adverse childhood experiences along with the cdc and recently we've announced a 2.75 million dollar grant to further that research and so you know, we see uh, important learnings to, to be had uh, looking at adverse childhood experiences and addressing them. Uh, we heard a lot about the importance of supporting mental health in schools. 
uh, and I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, the, the schools are the places where kids are, where we want them to be, and yet we know that in, in many instances they don't have the kind of support that they need. Um, so this is a really important policy area is, is to bring them that support. I, I think we, we talk a lot in the healthcare profession about medical homes and schools strike me as social homes, right? A places where kids and parents and staff and teachers all come together. Um, and we do uh, a fair amount of work in that space uh, with a program called Thriving Schools um, uh, that I could say more about, but uh, <laughs> given the time constraints, I won't. Um, uh, but needless to say, schools are an important place. So let me let me pause there um, and say thank you to all of our speakers and moderators who, as I said, I think were just incredible. Um, Mental Health America, Karen, you were thanking us, but thank you uh, to you uh, and the Kaiser Permanente staff for putting together just a terrific program. Um, thank you, Karen. Um, thank you, Mary. Um, thank you, Sydney. Um, and most of all, thanks to everybody who's uh, joined us. Um, we appreciate your interest in and your commitment to this work. And um, I really wanted to close out um, uh, with, with reminding people about Ariana, who you just saw again in the, in the question and answer, but um, you know, the, the importance of doing this work, not just for the young people, but with the young people. And uh, Ariana said, we're not going to stop. Uh, so I'd say let's all, Keep going forward together. Thank you.